we're very honored by your presence here. Isha Vidya is a cause that is very dear to Sadhguru's heart. It is from generous contributions from donors like yourself who help fund education, quality education for rural children in India who otherwise do not have access to that education. And because of your gift of education, this breaks the cycle of poverty for them and their families. So again, we thank you very much for being here. It's very much appreciated. I am Parag. I'm a volunteer for Isha Vidya. And my partner here is Anbu, um, who is also a volunteer for Isha Vidya. And we'd like to share a bit about Isha Vidya with you and also uh, Sadhguru's mission and vision of Isha Vidya moving forward. If I may share something personal, um, so I started sponsoring a child about three years ago. At that time, I just started with Isha, I was doing my practices, and I wanted to do something that was bigger than myself, to give something back. You know, I feel that I live a very privileged life here in the United States, and I want to do something back uh, for India and the children there. So I donated and online and I forgot about it. Two, three weeks later, I got an email from Isha Vidya saying that they had assigned a child to me and when I opened that attachment, a photograph of that child appeared. And with that photograph, there was a short description of where that child was, where he came from, who his parents were. And then I had this visceral reaction that my donation is helping this individual. I felt a connection with him that I can't describe. Since then, throughout the year, the child kept in touch with me. Uh, they send you report cards. Uh, I got a picture uh, that the child had drawn. And with that, I kept my connection with him. And I kept on thinking, I need to do this more. So in the end, we started sponsoring more kids and more kids and more kids to the extent that I have an eight-year-old son, and my son said to me when I was online, you know, looking at each of the websites, he said, you know, Papa, what are you doing? So I explained to him what we were doing, and at that time, he was, I think, six or seven, and he turned to me, and he goes, Papa, so I have brothers and sisters in India? I was like, yeah, you do. And then now, on his birthday, you know, he is a Fortnite fanatic. For those parents who here who have video games, it's a daily struggle that I have trying to get him off the computer and do something more productive. But anyway, we now come to agreement that on every birthday that he has, we sponsor one child. So he feels also that he's contributing uh, something at this early age. And I'm lucky enough to have a wife who understands that she's okay with my second family in India. My heart. I signed up just like Parag. I signed up to be a scholarship sponsor. Two months later, I went back home to visit my parents and I told my mother, I want to go see those children because the smiles are, you know, I want to see, experience that smile, that happy environment. And my mom said, let's go. So we went to Coimbatore uh, with my niece and uh, my son, this is eight years ago, my son was a third grader and uh, so I requested the teacher and I watched the third grade class because my son in America is in third grade. And the teacher said, yes, let's go. I entered the classroom. Within seconds, the children got up and said, Namaskaram, in chorus voice, in one voice. And then right back to their class. You know, they knew there was a visitor in the class but they went right back to the class. I'm watching the class, the teacher, they are, you know, like, so interacting with the teacher. At the end of the class, the teacher introduced me and she said, this is Anbu, she's a volunteer. She's come from America, she wants to talk to you. I'm unprepared to talk to the third graders. And uh, I speak uh, Tamil. So I started to speak in Tamil and the teacher said, will you come from America, speak in English, you know. And uh, I studied in Tamil medium back home. I studied in Tamil medium. 
Even though I went to a very good school, I couldn't speak a word of English until I came here. I came here to study masters here. I could hardly speak English. Uh, I'm an engineering student. And so I'm hesitant to talk to the kids in third grade in English. But the te teacher said, talk to them in English. So I introduced myself and I said, I'm Anbu, I'm a mechanical engineer. I work for a car company. And uh, one child got up and said, which company? I'm like, would they know General Motors if I said General Motors? Uh, so I said, then I realized GM has a presence in India. They make the Chevy. So I said, oh, the one with the plus sign. You know, I didn't even say the brand name. I said the one with the plus sign. One kid got up and said, Chevrolet. You know, they, they say it's Chevrolet. I said, yes, you know that. I said, like, yeah, we know Chevrolet. So they, one child asked me, what do you do? I said, I'm a mechanical engineer. I work in an assembly plant, we work with people and robots, and we put the parts together, and we build these big, large SUVs. It's really a pleasure to be here. I, I just, uh, I'm, I'm honored uh, to be invited and to be a part of this wonderful organization uh, in support uh, of the great work that Sadhguru is doing, um, as well as Isha Vidya. Um, I think I'm going to probably have a chance to speak a little bit more a little bit later about that. Um, but I just want to say uh, how important education is when we talk about joy, when we talk about bringing joy into the world and the universe into ourselves. You heard the personal stories about how much you receive when you're giving out. And when you're giving education, you're opening up a universe, no matter where you live, um, to small children and giving them uh, unlimited possibilities. And that gives back to you unlimited possibilities as well. And I think that's why it's so important that we're here today. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing uh, through Isha Video, all the volunteers. Um, it is just wonderful work. And to all the donors here today, you are doing great work. Uh, and you saw just in the video there, but I'm sure you're seeing it. Um, and I know I'll hear Think of a year's life in a child and what that means. And I know many of you are probably doing more than one year. And if you're not, I encourage you to do so. Um, but just think about those possibilities. Think about your best year in school ever. And think about all the joys that brought you and the possibilities when you were able to dream beyond what you had at that moment and where you came from. And think about that's what you're giving as a gift. Uh, and that joy. So I, I want to thank you on behalf of the state of New Jersey. I'm honored to be here today uh, and all the new friends that I'm making and I do look forward to golfing next year as well. Thank you so much. So without much ado, we would all like to call the person, the man who makes this happen. You know, this, all this started in less than a month and uh, it is his, when his name is behind this, I think success always follows. So I learned this uh, taking up any initiatives, so I would uh, like to invite uh, Sadhguru uh, on the stage here. function in 
they know some sense of fulfillment or joy. Only when they approach it with some sense of passion, whatever it is. Whether passion just for one person or larger things in the world, doesn't matter. Essentially, is one's involvement, a passionate involvement in something which makes the difference. We may call this family, we may call this children, we may call this friendship, we may call this nation, we may call this a global community, but essentially a passionate involvement. So, when passion is unidirectional, we generally call it passion. If it becomes of larger sense of inclusiveness, we call it compassion. An all-encompassing passion. Well, there is no tax, there are uh, Congress people here, there is no tax on love and emotion. Hello? Yes. New Jersey? No, not yet. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing. <laughs> so, uh, the sweetness of emotion, every human being should know. People know a little bit of love, anger, hatred, jealousy, fear, all kinds of nonsense going on. Our emotions are made within us. Hello? Is it made within you? Your emotion is manufactured within you. At least what comes from within you must be the way you want it. What comes from the world need not necessarily be the, be the way we want it because so many people are involved. Maybe they want to abuse you, maybe <laughs> they do, at least they may do to me all the time. <laughs> but uh, what comes out of you must be the way you want it, isn't it? What comes from within you must be the way you want it. I'm sure if you are given a choice, what comes from within you, you want it to be at highest level of pleasantness not of unpleasantness. So, Isha Vidya is uh, an effort by a group of dedicated people. They think they are volunteers, but uh, I'm actually a slave driver, making people work twenty hours a day, seven days of the week, three hundred sixty-five days, non-stop, non-stop going. Today we are over 4,600 full-time volunteers, all of us working seven days of the week, 365 days, on an average between 16 to 20 hours a day, all of us. And there are over nine million volunteers who are working part-time and contributing in many ways to support this activity. The activity ranges from nourishment, health, education, environment and above all uh, a non-denominational spiritual process approaching human well-being as a science, as a technology. For a long time human beings have tried to address their well-being with their belief systems, with philosophies, with ideologies. But a time has come where more people on this planet are able to think for themselves than ever before in the history of humanity. Never before this many people in the world could think for themselves. They're thinking right, wrong, we can debate, that's not the point, but they're thinking. Just hundred years ago, in most societies on the planet, women were even punished just because they thought for themselves, not because they did something. They think for themselves always drew punishment. So straight up, fifty percent of the population has come into the thinking process. So never before 
in the history of humanity this many people could think. This means since some sort of logical structure has entered everybody's minds. You may think somebody is illogical, but in their mental framework they have their own sense of logic. So once a logical framework establishes itself, illogical aspects will collapse. So people are hanging on to a few things, but philosophies, belief systems which lived for a long time have collapsed in many ways in people's minds. Just in… they've kept it as an archive, just in case if the airplane they're traveling in goes into a bad turbulence, just then they think God. Rest of the time they are… hello <laughs> They're on themselves. <laughs> Because this is the nature of a thinking mind, the more it begins to think, the more that cannot be substantiated will start collapsing. Right or wrong is not the issue, but you just cannot believe anything once you start thinking. You… you hang on to things because there is fear, there is insecurity, there is uncertainty about life. Because of this, largely people are keeping their belief systems like insurance policy. They do everything possible but just in case if things go wrong, I have also paid my premium. Why I'm looking at this right now is a time has come where you cannot satisfy people by making them believe something. You can to some extent but beyond that point it will not go. Today it is time we approach this human mechanism because this is the greatest piece of technology on the planet, no question. How to conduct this in such a way that this will generate what you want, not what somebody provokes. Not the situations will not decide the nature of my experience, but I will decide the nature of my experience. This needs to come. Why this is important is, just to give you some perspective, in 2017, we have produced enough food for about 21.5 billion people. But we had only 7 billion people or little more than that. But still 30 percent goes hungry on this planet. Still 40 percent of humanity is badly malnourished but we are producing four times the food that we actually need. Every one of us need to search within ourselves. Wh why? There is no food, somebody is starving, what can we do? But if there is food and somebody is starving, there is something wrong with us, isn't it? Hello? Somewhere our humanity has gone into storage. It's not active. So, Isha Vidya is an expression by a few hundred volunteers who are full-time on this. And uh, well, in my opinion, it's very small. People make it big. Why I'm saying it's very small is in India, there are 259 million children in schools. Well, we are handling, uh, including the adopted schools, maybe about 220,000 children. 220,000 children and 259 million children is a big thing. Well, all the 259 million children don't need support. They have parents and they have economic capabilities to do. At least 35 percent of them cannot afford education. It is those children that we are looking at and uh, at least thirty-five percent of them do not have enough nourishment to last out the day at school. If they are outside, they will pluck something from a tree, here, there, something they will eat. You lock them up in a school, school is like a prison. There is no food anywhere to forage. Uh, a rural child knows how to, you know, something he will do. He will go catch a fish in the pond, 
he will pluck a mango and eat it, he will find something else. But once you put him in the school, it's a no-food zone, there is really no food anywhere, you have to catch the rodents and eat, that's it. So, particularly school-going children lack nourishment because they go sit there from morning to evening and there is no food to find anywhere. So we found children come to school and uh, by one thirty, two o'clock they're just wilting away. Uh, that's when we started the nourishment program. Well, for a small number of children, it's working wonderfully well. Uh, well means uh, it's very difficult, I think she was trying to articulate what, what she saw there. I have not been to uh, this Isha Vidya school, not even once I have managed to go there and I've, I go there determined not to, uh, you know, show my tears to them. But I have not been able to come out without tears in my eyes. Simply the joy of uh, being there is so incredible because the parents are in abject poverty, these children are nearly sixty percent or at least forty-seven percent are first generation going to school. And the way they're blossoming, the way their enthusiasm, they're wanting to know and learn, uh, just… You, you just cannot come out of that place without tears in your eyes <laughs> So, this entire process has been happening in many different ways. Many individual human beings, corporations and others have been supporting. There are various efforts in the country, but unfortunately for the last fifteen, twenty years, many efforts which are essentially towards literacy is being passing… is passed off as education. So I was determined that I am not interested in literacy. What is the point? signing your name. You can as well put your thumb imprint. Anyway, once you have digital stuff and all, they are asking for thumb impression, nobody is going by your signature. Hello? <laughs> Even your iPad is asking for thumb imprint. If you go to the immigration, they are asking for thumb imprint. So what is the use of a signature? Just to learn to write your name, spend five years, uh, to manage to read two sentences. I think it's of no significance, we need proper education. Education which will get them out of that economic and social pit. That is why we focused on creating proper schools in remote areas. As good a school or in terms of quality of education, as good as they would get in the urban centers. People said, why should we do this? Can't we multiply the same money? I said, quality is important, it's just not the numbers. Yes, it is true, because of this somebody else may be denied, but what is the point of an education which doesn't really make a difference? It needs to make a difference. And uh, above all, a human being committing to do something to someone that they do not know, to someone that they may never see or meet in their life, but willing to commit to do something, is a… probably the highest level of expression of one's humanity. Thank you very much. And we are inculcating this in the children that I want them to know people who do not know them, people who do not know where they live, who they are, probably never see them in their life, but they are supporting your education. This is something that is constantly inculcated in the children because in today's world, one thing that's happening to this world is because of the type of news media that we have and the type of social media that is going on, where only disasters are news. Anything good is not, a, not newsworthy in this world today. Only something bad should happen. You want to get on the front page of the newspaper, don't worry about doing something wonderful. You may never get there. You just have to kill ten people, you will be on the front page. Yes, <laughs> you have to do something terrible to get onto the news. So, when we are disseminating this kind of stuff, the basic trust in another human being is being completely lost. This loss is not a small thing. When human beings 
cannot trust each other. Wherever we go, we look at every new face in a suspicious manner, well, we are destroying the very basic of… Uh, very basic fabric of human societies. Because human societies will thrive only when we are able to trust each other. When we see the best in the other person who is sitting there, not when we suspect the worst of every face that you see in the world. Right now, the way we are cultivating the world is just this, wherever we look, we think they may do the worst possible thing to us. No. Why are we thinking like this? This is being promoted. How many criminals do you think exist on this planet? What percentage? Two percent of the population may be criminal? Hello? In America, what's the percentage? Two huh? percent? Five percent? For this two or five percent, why are we sacrificing ninety-five percent? Ninety-five percent of the people never committed a crime. Why are we making the world look like everybody is going to… ready to commit a crime all the time? Most people have never thought about it in their life that they want to commit a crime. This is a fact. Hello? Yes, terrible things have happened in the world, but most human beings have never thought of committing a crime in their life. But right now we have created this distrust. From the youngest child, everybody is in a state of distrust. So this is something that we are trying to put back into the child's life. There are people on this planet who care for you, they don't know who you are. They don't even want to come and see that we have done this, how is my child growing up? No, it doesn't matter who he is. We know he is well and that's all that matters to me. So this trust is something that is very, very important. These few hundred thousand children who are with us, we are constantly inculcating this. We are telling there are people far away who do not know you but really, really care for you and they are doing this for you. And this gratitude is one dimension of the school that you will see if any visitor comes, the way the children respond to the visitors is amazing. When uh, those of you who are from Indian origin at least, when you go back to India, just walk into some school unannounced, okay? Don't inform them you're coming simply. They are on the Google map you can see and just walk. You will see your experience will be like this. There is a profound sense of gratitude in the children. I think that is more valuable than education itself for me. So thinking a bit about the work you're doing in India and here in America, I've heard you speak uh, a lot about teachers and principals and the importance of educators in this mix of um, supporting children. So I'm just curious your thoughts about how we can support teachers and educators in this endeavor so that they're showing up with that same joy, that same gratitude and bringing that to children and thinking about that here in the United States, how are we supporting teacher well-being so that we're creating environments of flourishing and thriving in our schools here and uh, in India as well. There was a gypsy in India. Uh, you don't have any gypsies left anymore. We still have them, some tribes, which are gypsy tribes which are nomadic and constantly moving. So. One day, a young boy doing his own thing, the father gets angry with him and says, You fool, if you don't learn some jugglery and some tricks, I will put you to school <laughs> and you will become an educated man and you will suffer from endless want. Unfortunately, the world's education has gone this way, not in one place, everywhere. I want you to look at this. Today we are talking about ecological damage, about ripping the planet apart. Educated people are causing more damage to this world or uneducated people are causing more damage to this world? You must tell me. Hello? Educated people. So obviously, in the name of education, we are driving people in a direction where all they will do is take more and more. If you are really educated, 
you must be able to live with just what you have within you, isn't it? This is what education is supposed to be. Education is supposed to be a wealth by itself. Huh? Hello? Education is supposed to be wealth. If you're educated, you must have enough in the, within yourself, you can almost live without anything from outside. But now we have created an education which creates an endless amount of want. And we are always seeing how to find more and more means towards this. I am not here to propound a philosophy for you, but all I am saying is, education in the world has taken a wrong turn everywhere. Education is no more about enhancing human horizons. It's about how can I get more? It's all about that. If you don't change the context of this, the content of the education is not important, something we have to impart, but the context, how it is delivered, if we do not change this, well, schools or the education system on the whole is like an industrial process. Everybody is going through the same extruder. Well, in some places, some individual schools might have found innovative ways to help cultivate a child to a better possibility. But I think that effort is very, very small. Everywhere, everywhere in the world, it's very, very small. We are doing other kind of schools called Isha home schools, where it is being… children are being cultivated in a very careful manner. Well, these children are fortunate, but we can't scale it up. It's very limited. I'm sure it's the same thing everywhere in every country that that sort of education is… we're not able to scale up simply because of the amount of input that it takes to make that happen. Well, there are population pressures, we have to educate every child, so we will set up an assembly line through which everybody has to go through, you like it, you don't like it. This could change in the next five years or ten years' time because uh, schools as you know it, education as you know it may just collapse because of the artificial intelligence and the digital transmission of information. If information is all you are going to transmit in a school, it will be just meaningless in another five years or ten years' time, already it is largely. So we need teachers who will be inspiring, who will be… Uh, in child's eyes, they must be like superstars. We don't need those serious, long-faced chemistry, they know some chemistry, they know some physics, they know some mathematics, this will be meaningless because it will be on my phone. Everything that you want to learn will be on the phone. So we need human beings who can inspire you, who can ignite a different level of seeking and searching within yourself so that you will become… Uh, you will use education as a way to expand your horizons rather than just make a living. So this is something we must decide. It's a hard decision to make maybe for a lot of people, but we must decide whether we want an education which will help people to make a living or to make a life out of themselves. That shines upon the earth, that gives me hope. Gives me ins you give me inspiration. Two weeks ago on the news, there was reservoirs in India that were drying up, and they talked about 600,000 people were out without water in India. And I kept thinking about what you do with the Rally for Rivers, and I haven't heard any updates, and I, you're the source. Can you give me a, us an update on what's happening with the increasing the water levels and people beginning to change their thoughts about conserving of water and taking care of our planet, because I, I, I believe that's, that, that's, the, that's the glue that holds everybody together is the environment. And you are the… I just thank you very much. If you didn't get an update. And also, how did the golf game go today? Hmm? How did the golf game go today? Uh, <laughs> I was playing with too many people. <laughs> but she took away my clubs. You got a good price for them. Well, uh, for those of you who do not know anything about it, I'll just introduce this a bit. Rally for Rivers uh, 
It's been on my mind for more than fifteen years, but I never spoke to anybody. I'm made like this. I let things cook in myself and find structure <laughs> before it comes out. So in 2017, I announced a date, fifty-nine days ahead of time, exactly fifty-nine days. And for the first time, I spoke to the core group and said, uh, we need to do a rally like this to rejuvenate India's rivers. And uh, mentally, I've written a policy, somebody needs to sit with me and write it down. Uh, they said, uh, this is a nationwide movement, Sadhguru, how can we do it in fifty-nine days? I said, we have to start on this date, it has to go. So the whole organization went into a <laughs> circus across the country. So we decided to cover sixteen states, starting from the southern tip called Kanyakumari to the Himalayan ranges. I decided to drive myself personally. So I personally drove 9,300 kilometers in twenty-nine days of the rally and uh, we did uh, 142 events in this thirty days or twenty-nine days to be precise. 162 million people participated in a thirty-day movement. Never before for anything, 162 million people have participated for any movement. So, Essentially, what I realized was, as I drove through the country covering sixteen states with six different political parties ruling these states at that time, and all of them willing to come… usually these opposition parties never agree upon each other, you know what I'm saying <laughs> uh, In India, it's little more kid up <laughs> So, uh, six different parties from this political spectrum of India all of them in one voice supporting me and participating in the rally for rivers. And along the way, these millions and millions of people participating, incredible level of support, I suddenly realized everybody wanted this to happen. They were just waiting for an idiot who is willing to bell the cat. And the moment I stood up, everybody was there wanting to support it. <laughs> uh, so there it was. So when we made this document, which is a, a recommendation policy for how to manage India's rivers, how to preserve and revitalize the rivers because on an average, all Indian rivers in the last fifty years have depleted forty percent, some of them over seventy percent. I don't know what all different states you come from, Andhra people are there? Oh, you're doing great here, all right? Krishna is over seventy-two percent down, Godavari is over thirty-five percent down, Kaveri is over forty-six percent down, Narmada is over sixty percent down, Ganga is over thirty-seven percent down, okay? So like this we can go on with terrible statistics. So this has been on my mind. So uh, when we wrote this policy and uh, that evening, Around 6.15, 6.20, I handed it over to the Prime Minister mm, and uh, next day morning by… we gave a physical copy to him, uh, this policy. Next day morning by 11.30, the Prime Minister's office calls and says, we need a soft copy because Prime Minister has formed a special group to look into the document and implement it. I thought, this is quick, huh? <laughs> This is really quick because in a democratic country, it is the number of people that you gather which will determine these things, hundred and sixty-two million people. When they saw the support, every government immediately stood up and said, yes, this needs to be done. So within two and a half months, the… there is a planning commission which is today called as Niti Aayog, which sent an official recommendation, which made this policy the official recommendation of the federal government for all the state governments because river in, in India, I think it is so here also, is a concurrent subject. The central government can only recommend. It is only the state governments which can actually act upon it. So, uh, three states are very proactive and they're implementing the policy very uh, vigorously. Another six states, we've signed MOUs with them. 
And uh, one state that is Maharashtra, are there people from Maharashtra, Mumbai people? So Maharashtra has been a super proactive state uh, because they have suffered enough with water deficiencies. So there is a particular river called Vagari in a region called Yavatmal. Yavatmal became notorious because it is known as the suicide capital of India. The number of farmers committing suicide in this region was so heavy because of the farmer distress. So we took this up, now we have had a cabinet approval and we have a budget uh, approved for about, uh, about seventy-five million dollars and uh, this is being in the process of implementation. This is a hands-on project we have taken on. We have taken this challenge in about two to three years' time. We will ensure there is not a single, single farmer suicide in this region and uh, we will double the farmer's income in two to three years' time. And in on an average of, let's say in eight years' time, we will see the farmer's income has gone up four to five times, that is five hundred percent, and the river will flow. This is the plan. Uh, our volunteers are on the ground meeting every single family, and every single family has a distress phone number, that in case of any distress, they can call one of the volunteers and immediate action will happen because we don't want any more suicides to happen in that region. So we've taken this hands-on. The next level of project right now is… Uh, it is… Uh, since morning I've been on the phone from very early in the morning <laughs> endlessly <laughs> because now we are crafting a next level of program called Kaveri Calling. For those of you who come from Karnataka and uh, Tamil Nadu, you know these sta two states are constantly at loggerheads with each other fighting for Kaveri water. How many of you? Kanna Kannada and Tamil people? Okay. Tamil people think Kannada people are drinking up too much water. <laughs> Kannada people think Tamil people are drinking up too much water. All the time they're accusing each other, you are drinking more water, I'm drinking more water. This is a simple process. See, uh, in this table, each one of you have your own glass of water. So you all sit there in a very civilized way. <laughs> Suppose there was only one glass of water for all of you, fighting would happen or not? Hello? It will happen. Inevitably it will happen, isn't it? So this has been happening. Kaveri is very dear to me because I grew up on the banks of Kaveri and I spent lots of time in this river. Once I floated down the river, for about hundred and sixty-five kilometers, thirteen days, I was on the river, just four truck tubes and a few bamboos, I floated down, I lived off the river. In my experience, this river and this region, I did not see this as a uh, water resource or something. I saw the river as a life much larger than me, a mega life which has been there for a million years. People like you and me come and go, but rivers and forests have been there forever. It is because they have stayed alive for so long, we come and go. If they are not there, we cannot even come and go. So when I saw that Kaveri has been depleting, the scientists and activists, not activists, the scientists say Kaveri has depleted by forty-six percent. But they are taking the monsoon time flows also, they are taking the overall average and saying forty-six percent. But in the month of September, October, if you look at Kaveri, how it was forty-five, fifty years ago when I was close to Kaveri, how she is today, she is twenty-five percent of what she was then. So people are wondering why there is water shortage. I am wondering why they don't realize that we've been working hard to destroy everything around us. Just to give you some understanding of this, in the Kaveri Basin, in the last fifty years, we've removed eighty-seven percent of the green cover. What is the plan, I don't know. In the Ganga Belt, for example, Ganga Basin accounts for twenty-five percent of India's geography and uh, thirty-three percent of India's agriculture. We have removed ninety-two percent of the green cover. Why this green cover is important is, why you would not understand probably by looking at United States rivers is because this is a temperate climate. In a tropical climate, 
all our precipitation comes in forty-five to fifty days of monsoon. The rain that comes down in forty-five to fifty days, we need to hold it in the land for three hundred sixty-five days. The only way you can do this is by having vegetation, substantial vegetation. There is simply no other way. So when we remove the vegetation, what is happening now is when the monsoon comes, there are heavy floods and at the same time, there are floods and droughts happening in the same region. In one part of the river, there is a flood, in another part of the river, there is a drought. Because what comes down today just goes down today to the ocean. It doesn't stay. It was staying because there was so much vegetation. As we remove the vegetation, our ability to hold the water is going away and it's running away. Because of this, there is a excessive exploitation of the groundwater. Probably India is doing the highest level of groundwater exploitation, it is around eighty-one percent. Eighty-one percent of the farm requirement is being taken from groundwater. Uh, we have borewell companies and borewell companies and borewell companies digging deeper and deeper and deeper, just to make you understand what it is. In Coimbatore city where we are right now, when I first went there, sixty to eighty feet we were getting enormous amount of water. Today to get the same amount of water we are going fourteen hundred feet. We must strike oil <laughs> We keep going like this. <laughs> but this is how it is. And uh, because the river water is not going to the ocean, uh, India is a peninsula, we have seven thousand four hundred kilometers of coastline. So this coastline has a very special ecosystem because of the river flow the marine water and the river water mixes up and there is a belt around the peninsula. And this, this uh, amount of uh, fresh water mixed with marine water is important to direct the monsoon towards the land. This has happened this time, I have been talking about this for last thirty years, I have shouted myself hoarse, people thought I have lost my mind. Now they are all sitting up and listening because this time monsoon came like this, avoided the land and went like this. Now they're all wondering why. I said, I've been telling you, I've been telling you, I've been telling you all along that once the river water stops flowing into the ocean, the rains will not come in your direction, they will go into the ocean, they will not come towards the land. And also because there is something called as transpiration, amount of vegetation will determine where it sheds the rain. The cloud will pass, but where actually rains comes down depends on the transpiration process. So there are many aspects to this, I don't want to go into the whole science of it. The simple thing is this, there's a beautiful saying, the ancient wisdom in India is like this. In Tamil language there is a saying that only if Kaveri comes walking, she's prosperity. If she comes running, she's a disaster. If she has to walk, there needs to be substantial vegetation so that water is held and it comes slowly. We must understand in a tropical region, river is not the source of water. River is the destination for the water. It should not reach the destination so quickly, it should go slowly. So for this to convert one third of Kaveri Basin, which accounts for about eighty-three thousand square kilometers, right now we are doing this movement in the month of September. I am personally with a team of people, I am riding on a motorcycle, uh, fourteen hundred kilometers we are riding um, along the river Kaveri, camping along river Kaveri and doing about thirty-five events creating awareness. We are asking the governments to give us some incentive towards… Uh, for the farmers to shift from normal farming to agroforestry. We've already converted sixty-nine thousand seven hundred and sixty farmers in Tamil Nadu from regular farming to uh, agroforestry and their incomes have gone up anywhere between six to eight times in about eight to ten years time. So income, the, it is an economic plan with a very positive ecological impact because in a country like India where there is such a pressure of population and land, proportion is such, unless economy and ecology walk in hand in hand, if they go against each other, it's not going to work. They have to go hand in hand it's very, very important that ecological solutions are also economic solutions for the people. That is how this is crafted. We want to 
push towards uh, converting one third, that is 33 percent of Kaveri belt into green cover. We need as much support as we can get from across the world. We have not yet started the campaign from June 16th, I'm sorry, July 16th, which is the Guru Purnima, we are launching the campaign and in the month of September we actually go, if you want to travel with us down the Kaveri um, for about 13 or 14 days, you are welcome to do that but you need to register. We will be taking about 125 to 150 people max in that uh, campaign. So uh, you will get to camp in some really beautiful places in Karnataka where there's a lot of wildlife but once we enter Tamil Nadu, there is no wildlife or uh, forest there along Kaveri. So there are a lot of significant, uh, powerful um, spiritual uh, places or temples which are built for water element, temples which are built for fire element like this. So we are doing a sacred tour along the next leg of the tour in uh, Tamil Nadu. Above all, the most important thing is this will change the dynamics of farmers economic condition because that is the only way to bring a solution. So that's where Rally for Rivers is and uh, it is very vibrant. And I gave a call during Rally for Rivers. I asked the youth to come and serve for three years for Rally for Rivers. Hundreds of them have come full time. Many of them have uh, resigned or given up well-paying jobs and they're working. I said there's only one qualification. Just for three years, don't ask one question, what about me? Just one question you don't ask me, then we'll make this a success. So these youth who have come from different parts of the country, we have trained them and now put them on the ground. They're doing an incredible amount of work. Mm, all we are doing is their transportation and their food is being taken care of and they are doing such a fabulous job out there. The most important thing of this is, the soil has gone very, very weak in India. We must understand this is a land where… which has known agriculture longer than anywhere else in the, on the planet. Over twelve thousand years we've been farming the same land and we managed to keep it fertile. But in last two generations or one generation actually, in the last forty years, the soil quality has gone down so much that the food that we grow has no strength in it, that's what has happened. The real problem is soil. If there is not enough organic content in the soil, you cannot retain water in the soil. It's slowly we're converting fertile soil into sand-like situation. So the United Nations has uh, given a prescription that minimum two percent organic content should be there in soil to consider soil as soil. But today in nearly twenty five to twenty seven percent of Indian soil, the amount of organic content has become point zero five percent. Sixty percent out of one hundred and sixty million hectares of arable land, hundred and four million hectares of arable land is right now being labeled as distressed soil. With one point four billion people, what is the plan? This is not a simple thing, it's a tremendous issue. This, this could be… this could spell which way India goes. This is… Uh, when I said this, people thought I'm alarmist, but now dead bodies are falling. I said last year, you need to take care now. I've been going hoarse talking about this forever, but if you don't take care, you will see dead bodies, not in dozens. You will see them in hundreds. If you don't wake up, you will see them in thousands or maybe hundreds of thousands because that's where the water situation is going. Uh, but this year, governments have woken up and the Prime Minister has given a call, big movement is happening, but uh, this is not something that you're going to fix in a matter of one or two years. If we want the soil to become rich, there are only two ways, leaves from the trees and the animal waste. There's simply no other way to put organic content back into the soil. Trees have gone long time ago, animals are all uh, traveling abroad. Yes, sir. India has become the largest beef exporter. If you say one word, people think you're religious nut. <laughs> yes, if you… if you try to talk about it, people think you're some kind of a religious nut. 
uh, because you don't want cows or this. So we are pushing for a law. If anybody wants to own one hectare of agriculture land, they must have five bovine animals on the land. Otherwise, they must be dispossessed of the land because we are killing the soil. We have no business to live a barren soil to the next generation. It doesn't matter if you don't build industries. <coughs> it doesn't matter if you don't build industries. It doesn't matter if you don't build big marketplaces. But we must leave a rich soil for the next generation because that's what makes these bodies. How can we resist not comparing ourselves with others and how not to always seek approval from others? This is a, an ailment we are cultivating from a very early age. Because uh, even in a kindergarten school, somebody is first, somebody is last and somebody is one, two, three. So you get this problem that I want to be number one. I don't know, what is this pursuit about the smallest number in the numeral, you know, in the mathematical <laughs> If you said, I want to be a million, I can understand <laughs> I want to be one <laughs> Very small aspiration <laughs> So, uh, if uh, you are number one, what about the rest? So you essentially enjoy other people's failures. When you thrive on other people's failures, I don't call that success, I call that sickness. What do you think? Hello? Well, I want to be well, this is not a problem. But I want to be better than you, this is a problem. Because you cannot be better than anybody or worse than anybody. Human experience of life is not determined by what you have or what somebody thinks or not. It's determined by the fundamental nature of how it works within you. So, you seek approval, you compare yourself because this infection has already happened from an early age. You're always thinking how… who is better than who? Have you found another person exactly like you on this planet anywhere? Huh? Hello? You're a unique creature, aren't you? And uh, that is the saving grace. Just imagine, if there was one more person like you in your home, could you live there? <laughs> Hello? One is too much, isn't it? So when you are such a unique creature, what are you trying to compare yourself with somebody with? So essentially this problem about comparing yourself with somebody, wanting to be better than somebody has come because our systems of education have not cultivated this dimension, how to find a profound worth within myself. This dimension is simply missing. It's all about how am I one step ahead of you? See, if you're trying to be one step ahead of me, maybe you could fly, but now you're happy walking one step ahead of me. What a tragedy, isn't it? Maybe you could have… you could be flying, who knows what is your competence? But because you compare yourself with somebody else, you will end up doing… if they are doing one nonsense, you will do little more nonsense and think you're better than them. The entire human potential and human genius has been destroyed on this planet because of this. Right now, I would say not even one percent of human beings really allow their genius to overflow. Rest of them are always trying to be one step ahead of somebody else. This is a… this is a major disaster. So maybe when schools are destroyed, I'm saying once technology comes at a certain level, you will see schooling as you know will be destroyed. I think probably it's another ten, fifteen years away, maximum twenty years away, schools will be destroyed, they won't exist the way you know. 
that go there, sit there and learn this and that for a full day and come back, that kind of school will go away. So, when that happens, maybe a more personal application will come, probably it will be a little better place where it's not about being better than somebody, it is about finding some worth within yourself. See, this happened in many different ways. I remember this very well. In Mumbai, Mezogon Docks, hmm, Mumbai people are there. In seventies, I… all this labor used to go into strike. One reason that they went to a strike for a strike at that time is, the first gantry was installed to unload ships. At that time, most of the vessels, seafaring vessels, were anywhere between twenty-five to thirty thousand tons. To unload a twenty-five thousand ton uh, vessel, the labor, the physical labor which goes inside and carries bag by bag, sack by sack or whatever, they were taking anywhere between twenty-three to twenty-eight days. Today, in the modern ports, even in India, the vessels are all over hundred thousand tons, some of them nearly quarter million tons. They unload them in less than twenty-four hours because of machinery. So when this machinery came, the labor went into strike because man's muscle was being replaced by machine. I want all the ladies to appreciate these machines. Only because of these machines, man's muscle became irrelevant and that's why all of you are sitting here. Yes, yes, if man's muscle was supreme, whoever had the big muscles would be the boss here. We would make you the king if you really had big muscles at one time. Today if you have big muscles, at the most we'll put you at a security job outside, <laughs> at the gate. So now memory has taken the… memory has taken the place of the muscle. Today. If you read ten books and remember, we'll call you a scholar. If you just read one book, you become a religious person and uh <laughs> Yes, uh, you can become a representative of God because you just only read one book. Just memory. This always bothered me. When… when I went to school, when I… five, six years of age, I just looked at these teachers strutting around. I thought they just read a book a few years ahead of me, how that… how does it make them so supreme? I… I just never understood that. <laughs> so somebody reads a book a few years ahead of you and they are strutting around as if they are on top of the world. This will go because my phone can do ten PhDs a day. It has enough memory to do that. So this whole thing about carrying memory in your head and thinking that you have gotten somewhere will go away. Why I am saying this regarding your question is, <clears throat> somebody can remember a lot of things, somebody cannot remember so many things. They should not decide who is better than whom, isn't it? Right now, the biggest mistake our education systems have made is, we have made people misunderstand memory as intelligence. As machines come, you understand memory can be stored, what you can store in your entire brain, a machine can store it in a small piece of something, yes? Yes or no? So, as man's m muscle become… became irrelevant, your memory will become irrelevant. So then what do you think will be the most important thing? What kind of a human being you are will become the most important thing? <laughs> Wonderful times coming, huh? <laughs> so, with yourself, why are you bothered how somebody else is? You should have no time for anybody. There is enough work to do upon this. Hello? Yes or no? There is enough work to be done upon this, where is the time to judge other people as good or bad and then place yourself above them or below them? This happened, can I tell you a joke? <laughs> a lady went to the butcher's shop. And uh, she went to those chicken which were hanging upside down. You know, for a chicken, 
its feathers are its dress. But we pluck them out and then we say it's a dressed chicken for some reason. <laughs> so they dressed them up like that and they were hanging upside down. So this lady went, lifted the wing, smelled and wrinkled her nose, lifted the leg and wrinkled her nose. Like this she was going from chicken to chicken. It was having an effect on all the other customers who were there. So the butcher saw it is having an effect on the customers, so he went and tapped on the lady's shoulders. She turned around. He said, ma'am, can you pass a test like this? So don't put anybody to test that you yourself cannot pass. <laughs> it's okay, people are made different ways, you don't have to put yourself above them or below them. And so my question is the role of deception and lying that I've kind of been observing in the world. Um, so I've almost noticed that to operate in business and in government, there's a level of deception that's validated, that you almost need to be able to withhold information strategically or kind of mislead people at different times. And being on the spiritual path, there's so much of an emphasis on truth. And it almost seems at times that those two can be at odds with one another. So how do you reconcile being someone that lives within truth, but also becoming an effective leader and being effective in the role that you have to do in the world? What kind of spirituality are you doing? <laughs> I'm I very think, uh, confused. You're you're taking your high school moral science seriously. You're taking your high school moral classes very seriously and thinking that is in coming in conflict. Yes, of course it will come in conflict because that, is, that was never supposed to be practical. Suppose you play a game. Let's say you play tennis. Do you want to place the ball where your opponent is not expecting or do you want to place it where they're expecting? In somebody else's view, you can put makeup and think they're enhanced. You you, f you may feel enhanced because they think you are enhanced. But in your experience of life, can you be enhanced without enhancing some faculty of yours? Hello? You can see better, hear better, speak better, do something better. Only then you feel enhanced, isn't it? Hello? So spiritual process is about enhancement of who you are so that you can function from a higher level of higher perspective of life. If you are very basic, you will function in a basic way. If you could do anything you want, then you will function. Have you seen when you are very capable, you are also very magnanimous? Hello? Generous? Yes or no? When you are struggling, you are quite nasty. Hello? Because you yourself are meager, uh, then you become stingy, then you become mean because you are so meager. It's very important you enhance yourself in all levels, in terms of your joy, in terms of your peacefulness, in terms of your faculties, in terms of your abilities, you must enhance yourself. That is when you can be a magnanimous life. Otherwise, what's there to give when you yourself are a beggar throughout your life, when constantly you are struggling to have something, how will you do anything truly wonderful? It's not possible. It doesn't matter what values you carry, all those values don't work. You can pretend. You can pretend in small ways. You cannot really do anything big unless you are enhanced within yourself, isn't it? So enhancement will not come if it happens. Then you'll play the game well, you will enjoy that somebody is hitting the ball in such a way that you can't get it, but you go and get it, that's when you're a great player, isn't it? So that's the same in business, that's the same in government, that is the same in international transactions. Everywhere that's the whole thing because they want to hit the ball in such a way that you can't get it. If you can't get it, you have not strived to enhance yourself. The problem with most people is they are trying to enhance their activity without enhancing themselves. If you enhance activity without enhancing yourself, of course you freak with every… at every turn that happens in your life. See, successful people are freaking their minds out simply because they have upped their activity without upping themselves. Without upgrading this one, you upgraded the activity, it's freaking the hell out of you. 
if you upgrade this, then activity will upgrade itself, you don't have to do anything. It's like, what do you drive? Suppose you've got a bicycle going, nice, it's a good exercise, that is nice. But suppose you bought a Ferrari, suddenly you don't have to bother about speed, if you touch it, it goes. Huh? Really, you don't have to do it. Simply if you touch it, boom, it'll go. Why the machine is enhanced? If you enhance this machine to the highest possible level, you don't worry about enhancing activity. Activity will get enhanced by itself. Now you are trying to enhance activity without enhancing the machine. If you fail, you will suffer. If you succeed, you will suffer. Thank you very much. I think people are hungry for dinner. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Suman. It's always been great to actually participate in the programs organized for Sadhguru. Uh, I'm at the golf joint and uh, this is basically to sponsor education in, in, to, for children in India. And it has been uh, really great, um, the work he's been doing. And it really, I think, um, helps me want to do more for them too. Dear friends, we are at the Isha Golf Jaunt where uh, none other than the amazing uh, and the divine uh, Sadhguru Jaggi Vasudev, he played golf uh, with few uh, wonderful sponsors who have uh, donated to those uh, kids of uh, rural India uh, who are underprivileged and uh, who are uh, trying to come out of uh, the cycle of poverty which is a wonderful cause and we have those uh, amazing donors here. So Harjot, tell me about your uh, experience at this uh, Isha go Golf Jaunt and your experience and the uh, presence of Sadhguru, how you felt on the golf course? Yeah. So first of all, you know, we don't have words to express our gratitude and appreciation uh, for Sadhguru to let us be part of an initiative, something which is so close to his heart. Uh, so anything which is important for him, as his disciples and devotees is important for us as well. And we understand, you know, what he's trying to do uh, through Isha Vidya, the rural region of your nation, provide resources to kids in rural India so that they can enhance their lives as well. So, you know, so it was great to be part of the cause and it was a lot of fun playing golf with him, <laughs> you know. He's a Absolutely. great golfer. Yes. Uh, you can see a yogi, a guru playing golf, you know. Yeah, and um, he's very competitive and he's fun. So, uh, we couldn't have asked for a better date uh, with anybody, so it was a golf date with Sadhguru. Thank you, thank you so much for uh, sharing your views. So Vijay, tell me about your experience uh, at the golf course with Sadhguru and any uh, strange or good experiences with him on the course. It was an incredible day. Um, and we had, when, when we think about the perfect foursome to play golf, I couldn't have asked for a better foursome than what I played today. Um, and the first thing that I noticed when he stepped onto the first tee, most of us come out to the course and we warm up and then we stretch out and then we hit a few shots and we come to the first tee to take the first shot. Uh, Sadhguru comes out of his car and does a few stretches and without any practice, he takes the first swing and hits it straight down the fairway. I've seen a lot of his videos, but I am truly blessed to see him in person today because of the way he conducts himself anywhere he goes, including the golf course. And both of us are avid golfers and a lot of us learn by watching people play. And when we watched him, one of the most important things that I saw about his swing and his ability to handle himself on the course was he was appeared to be super peaceful even on top of a golf ball before he took the swing. And uh, something that he's been a proponent of teaching people about just controlling their breathing on the course, I actually saw it in person. And uh, his ability to forget bad shots and come back with a spectacular one right after tells you that he has mastered the ability of controlling his emotions and his breathing. This is something that you can learn from just by watching him. And uh, like Harjot said, he's just an incredible competitor and he's a really, really fun person to be with. Um, the only regret I have is we could only play four holes with him today. I wish we could play the whole 18. I'd be a much better golfer at the end of the day. Hi, I'm Suraj Saxena 
And uh, I think my overall experience today with Seth Green was just unbelievable. In honesty, I can't really describe it, but just seeing him being next to him, like you see so many videos of how much he helps people and whatnot, and just being inside like five feet of him like this, it just brought almost, almost tears to my eyes because of what he does for people and like just being able to play golf with him, something I love and sharing my passion with him about golf has really helped me and like I think it, honestly today was one of the best days of my life honestly because being able to be with Sadhguru and just learn from him what he does in the golf course and what I can also learn from him is amazing and I think just overall Isha and their cause to help kids that need education and whatnot is amazing so just to be here it's truly an honor because I know that I'm helping those kids as well achieve their goals their dreams and making them more successful in ways that they weren't able to before so thank you hi uh, my name is Pooja Bharadwaj and I'm here at a charity fundraising event for Isha Vidya uh, with Sadhguru um, I came here because it's a wonderful opportunity to give back. Sadhguru is doing a lot of wonderful work with children in Isha Vidya, and I came here to support the event. Um, I had the privilege of asking a question, and Sadhguru gave me his answer in a very, very roundabout way, um, but in a very, very powerful way. Uh, my question was on understanding the mechanics of how to operate in the world. Um, and somehow how Sadhguru manages to answer the person, uh, he was able to answer me today. Uh, I feel tremendously uh, grateful for the opportunity to be a part of something like this and to support him in the work that he's doing in the world. And I hope that whatever I was able to do by attending is able to help a child today. Uh, hi Anbu, it was nice uh, uh, meeting you and uh, witnessing your wonderful story and the way you met Sadhguru and all the sequences and the miracles which happened in your life which led you to uh, Isha Vidya and the Isha Foundation. So tell me about your experience of the whole of uh, the Isha and the Isha Gaunt. Uh, I mean why, uh, why this uh, event is, I mean what this event is all about and uh, what is your overall perspective? So happy to be here today. Uh, this is, as you said, it's uh, for Isha Vidya golf jaunt uh, with Sadhguru. Um, Sadhguru played golf and uh, today, now, right now, people are having dinner and each one of the people here is an Isha Vidya scholarship sponsor. Um, I have been part of uh, Isha Vidya for the last uh, eight years. I've had the greatest privilege and honor to go to one of the schools in the uh, rural part of uh, Tamil Nadu to witness the magic happening in these schools. In rural setup, Sadhguru's vision is to provide quality education for the children. Most of these children are first time, first generation school goers. Sadhguru wanted them to receive such a quality education so that they can come back and transform the lives of their village, you know. So, the, so I went and witnessed the magic that's happening. And ever since, uh, I have become part of the uh, Isha Vidya volunteering team. So it's been a real honor for me to be here. And I uh, sincerely thank every one of them here uh, who's participated in the golf and also dinner and uh, sponsoring this event. Thank you. Today's golf jaunt where people got to play golf with Sadhguru and then now everyone's enjoying a lovely dinner with Sadhguru was all possible through his grace. And through his grace, he's given us the possibility to help underprivileged children in India by providing sponsorships for them for their education. At Isha Vidya, we like to provide a quality education to rural children so that way we can help them break the cycle of poverty by giving them the gift, the tremendous gift of education. And that's what today is all about. Uh, that's why all the people here came out to support Sadhguru and Isha Vidya and everyone I think has left a little bit changed and transformed and will continue to support all the good works he does with Isha Vidya.